Hey everyone, Dr. Jack Gordy here, continuing the series of the cellular basis of disease. And I want to jump into fungus, fungus as pathogens. Now they're massively overlooked as pathogens, as we'll jump into later. Um, but before I can talk about fungus as pathogens and causing disease, first I need to introduce what fungus are and where they sit on the tree of life and some of the basic facts about the structures and molecular biology of fungus. Now this image right here um, is, you know, a, a macro fungus, one of these really visible fungus that you can see growing in the forest. We eat them, you know, mushrooms, we don't eat this guy. Um, but this photo I actually took um, with a long exposure, but some fungus glow in the dark. Um, we don't know why, uh, but it's just such a cool photo and I'm super proud that I took it. So uh, yeah, here's what we're talking about today, fungus. Right, so let's jump into fungus. Where do they sit on the tree of life? Well, they eukaryote. Um, so they have mitochondria and all the other good stuff. Where do they sit as diseases? Well, they're communicable. They uh, can be spread and they're infectious. Now, one important point on this is fungus are all not obligate pathogens. They're opportunistic pathogens. They don't have to live on and feed up from us, but they can. And so they often infect people who are immune compromised. They often infect the very young or the very old, okay? So that's uh, when, or if you get dysbiosis is another great example. So if you have um, a drop in good microbes and you don't have that sort of healthy blend of microbes on your skin or in your body, fungus can sort of proliferate and then become a pathogen. Uh, but they're not obligate pathogens, they're opportunistic. Um, so fungus can be sort of broken up into fungus, yes, fungus, but within fungus is yeast. So yeast is fungus. When you're drinking beer, you're drinking a fungus drink, which is kind of weird. Um, and so this would be the Venn diagram. All yeasts are fungus, but not all fungus are yeasts. Um, now, uh, fungus can be both multicellular and single cellular. So uh, here we have those macro fungus that we're all very familiar with. And here we have a single cell one. And these are actually undergoing um, mitosis there so they're budding off and dividing now the single cell ones that's what we call yeast so that's how we end up with that venn diagram right yeast are the single cell fungus um, and other fungus that are multicellular we typically just call fungus um, now what are those multicellular guys made out of well they're made out of these long filaments that we call hyphae um, and uh, these filaments can um, either be had the cells separated so the, it's just a long chain of individual cells but in some fungus those separations aren't there and so it's just almost like long one continuous cell but there are nuclei dotted along it it's a very peculiar kind of uh, structure that you can end up with but those are hyphae now, molds are also fungus. So penicillium mold made very fa famous by um, the production of penicillin, Alexander Fleming's experiment. They look like this. They're very common, typical green molds growing on things. Um, and this is what they look in a petri dish, and this is what they look under a microscope. And we see that they've got these hyphae. So these are multicellular um multicellular fungus but it gets a little bit more complicated than that so i drew a hard border between yeast and fungus in my previous venn diagram but it's actually a bit more of a soft fuzzy border between the single cell yeast and the multicellular things that we typically call fungus so here's one example penicillium mold again um, but at different temperatures one's at 25 degrees and we can see it forms hyphae but at a warmer 37 degrees it's now forming yeast cells so this is called dimorphic, two morphologies, dimorphic. And it means that they can appear both as yeast and with these hyphae-like structures. That's super important because candida um, albicans, which is one of the most common fungal infections to infect humans, is also dimorphic. But I'm going to touch on that in a later video. Let's zoom in, have a look at a, uh, a fungus cell or a yeast cell, um, and we can see some similarities, some structures here that are very similar to either animals or plants. And it's a good way to think about fungus as a halfway between animals or plants. So it has a large vacuole, um, and that's for storage mostly, and that's much more like plants, right? So it has this large vacuole, has a cell wall, um, and this is much more like uh, a plant as well. It's rigid, so uh, fungus can maintain weird structures like hyphae. Um, and this is much more like a plant, but there are molecular differences between the cell wall of a fungus and a cell wall of a plant. Um, but there's no chloroplasts in our heterotrophs. Heterotroph, of course, meaning that they have to eat 
um, organic material, either dead or alive, um, to eat. And so they can't harvest energy like chemical energy from volcanic vents or solar energy from the sun. They are dependent on other people, uh, on other organisms. So they're called heterotrophs. They're not called autotrophs, which would be the ones that can handle uh, collecting energy from the sun like plants. So in that respect, they're more like animals and less like plants because they're heterotrophs. Let's zoom in that cell wall. I, I touched on it, that's a bit different. So it's made of mostly sugars. And um, here's an interesting term, it's called hexose, which is, uh, basically means a hexagonal sugar. Now there's lots of different hexoses out there, but almost all like structural um, things that we find in cell walls, like um, um, uh, peptoglycan, which we find in bacteria, cellulose, which we find in plants, and the cell wall of a fungus, they're made out of these hexose like sugars. Now, in the cell wall of a fungus, almost everything is glucose. There's one uh, little exception to that, but almost everything here is either long chains of glucose in some form. But let's zoom in and, uh, and cover each of these layers so we understand what's going on here. Um, so we have the phospholipid bilayer, like all cells have, um, you know, made out of those phospholipids, the hydrophobic, hydrophilic interactions that make this phospholipid bilayer. Then we have chitin. Now chitin is a modified glucose that has an amino group and it's those chains of those hexagonal molecules. You can see I've drawn them here with little hexagons. Those chains are little hexagonal mo uh, molecules um, and it's modified ever so slightly to have um, a, a nitrogen group and amino group there. Now the key thing about chitin is that if you have if you are a fungus you have chitin. It's one of the defining features of fungus. So if you have a uh, if you are a fungus, you have chitin, but not all things that have chitin are fungus, just to make it a bit more confusing. Um, in a previous video, I covered horizontal gene transfer, which is where bacteria can send genes between each other, which is super cool. Uh, but horizontal gene tra transfer can actually happen between species and between kingdoms even. And so there are some bacteria that look like they have stolen the gene of the enzyme that produces chitin. And so now there are bacteria with chitin, but they have stolen it through horizontal gene transfer. Um, but also uh, beetles, the hard shell of beetles is made out of chitin. And so um, there, there does seem to be uh, some uh, use in the animal kingdom. Um, and it seems to have come from the common ancestor of fungus and the animal kingdom. So uh, key thing there is if you're a fungus, you have chitin. So it's a, it's a compulsory thing. The next is a, a layer of glucan. So glucan means uh, a chain of glucose in the hexagonal structure there. there. Uh, and so it's a hexose, but it's glucose. Now glycan is in peptidoglycan, which we find in bacterial cell walls. Gly refers to sugars, whereas glue refers to the sugar glucose. So glucan is chains of glucose, whereas glycan is chains of um, different kinds of sugars. So not just glucose. And that's what we see in bacteria, we see glycans, but in fungus, we see glucans. And up the top here, this is the exception, it's not glucose, so this is a mano protein, um, and so this is just a glycosylated protein, there's that word gly again, which means sugars, not just glucose but a range of sugars there um, so gly can refer to any sugar and in this case it refers to the sugar mannose so we've got manno protein which is a glycosylated protein chains of them all along the surface of the uh of the fungus um, and the sugar that's attached to those proteins is mannose and that's why we call it a manno protein now let's jump into what those do so phospholipid bilayers they you know they control the inputs and outputs of the cell it allows Allows the cell to create a unique environment inside of the cell and dictate what goes in and what goes out. That's the phospholipid bilayer. That's in all cells. That's what. That's the point of it in all cells. There, um, the chitin and the glucan are just structural rigidities, allowing the fungus to take different sh uh, shapes. But also, this gives it robustness in the environment. If you were to take some of my cheek cells, smear them on the desk there. They would dry out, they would undergo temperatures that they don't like and osmolarities that they don't like and they would die incredibly quickly. This doesn't happen with fungus because they have uh, this rigid outer wall which allows them to resist things like osmotic pressure and um, dehydration and all that kind of stuff. So um, it, it makes them a more robust organism, allowing them to handle different environments, which is kind of necessary if you're an opportunistic pathogen because you live 
other places and then infect humans. You have to be able to handle things like soil and bloodstreams, which are incredibly different. So um, having things like a cell wall is really helpful for that. And that's the structural rigidity from glucan and chitin. Um, now the mannoproteins allow the yeast and the fungus to interact with the outside world. That's why it's the outer layer. Um, and critically for us when we're talking about disease, that's where virulence uh, factors are going to be in there. So remember, virulence factors are factors that improve the infectious nature of the pathogen. And so these mannoproteins are critical for that. So for example, if they want to adhere to our skin cells, that's going to be the mannoprotein interacting with our skin cells, the keratin protein of our skin. And so... Um, the, the factors on the mannoproteins, the structures and the molecular uh, uh, the molecular properties of it are going to dictate the virulence factors of that fungus uh, as they try to invade us as a pathogen. Ah, brilliant. So that's just a brief introduction into fungus and yeast. And up next, I'm going to go through the yeast life cycle as an example of chemotropism. Um, and then after that, we're going to jump into the pathogen candida albicans. Thanks, everyone.